people found. Yeah, 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 yeah. I appreciate that people were respectful. I have something a little bit earlier than usual today, so I moved it to 11. I don't know if 11 is a good time. If 11 is a better time. That's also okay with me. It's really hard for me to know what's good for people. It's somewhat all the same for me. So 11, 11, 15, 11, 30. Okay, we are learning about the Haftarah of the week. And first thing we need to do, I mean, it's only our second meeting, but we're learning how to do this in the best way that makes the most sense, at least for me and my brain. And I think the first thing is always to do a summary, a recap of the Torah portion. Because for me, what's interesting always is where does it connect? Where does it relate? And everybody mm -hmm. is welcome to ahead of time read the Haftarah or have it open for yourself. I did pull it up on Sparia, so I will have it up on the screen. But before that, I wanted to go over Parashat Toledot, which is the Parsha this week, and see what are the themes that come up there. And then using that, we can look into the Haftarah and see what does seem to fit, what doesn't seem to fit. Is it a tenuous connection? Is it a little bit stronger connection? Anybody want to take a stab at what Toledot is about? Mm. Anybody? It was still in the stories. It's a lot easier. No, nobody quiet group today? Okay, I can tell you then. Toledot starts out, remember we less, we, Carol, did you want to say something? Oh, yeah. Isn't it with, um, no, that Isaac and Rivka have twins, right? Right. So we finished last week's parasha where Rivka was found by the servant and brought to Yitzchak and they got mm. married. And that makes sense. Hello. Hi. Right. And that makes sense that um, Felice is coming on, but I don't think she hears yet. That makes sense that the next thing is, what is their family? So I hear my wife calling me. So they yes, I'm to Rabbi Bracha. <laughs> right, and how the and the baby, and she has a prophecy that the babies are going to be at war with each other. Wait, wait, yeah. Oh, oh, she has a prophecy. Yes, I guess you could say that. That's mm -hmm. true. She goes, Lidosh et Hashem. She, she asks Hashem or she asks something, right? Because they're running around inside of her. And then who was born? Yaakov mm -hmm. and Esav. They are twins, clearly not identical twins. They seem to be fraternal no. twins. Yeah, because they seem to be so different. Their nature doesn't matter so much, but physically it sounds like they were very different. And then what continues on is the story that um, Isaac, it seems like Isaac Yitzchak favors Esav. It seems because he brings him delicious things to eat. We're not exactly sure if there's a little more to that considering mm -hmm. that Yitzchak was one of our forefathers. But Rivka seems to have clearer insight, and she loves Yaakov. I didn't know that this means that they don't love the other one, by the way. But the, yeah. the Torah is absolutely setting up one against the other. I'm just not sure where the talking is coming from. I can't see who's unmuted. Okay. <clears throat> what happens is that Yitzchak, first of all, you should just know that the Esav, is that there? One day the no. Oh, sorry. Let's make sure. I'm not sure what you sent to us, Lance. What is that? It's a drasha by Rabbi First about the about Toldot. And I think it's brilliant. Um, he's a high school teacher, oddly enough. Um, but I think uh, this is just as good as any drasha I've ever read. And okay, it's great. filled with um allusions to the rabbis. But at the end, he talks about um, Rabbi Soloveitchik, and, and that's the key, that last paragraph. Okay, great. Thank you. I don't think can, we can, can get it now. You should be able to class. just click on it and get it. Right, 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 right. But right now, we're okay, great. So we'll save that for, I'll save it at least for later. And if I don't save it, maybe you could send it to me because I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do it while I'm doing this. Okay, thank be you. Be delighted. What? I'll be delighted to send it to you. Sure. After. So before that happens with the blessings, I don't know, Carol, if you were going to say, there's another scene. There's a scene about the birthright, the Bechora. By the way, we're not exactly sure what this Bechora is all about. We're not sure what it grants or doesn't grant. It's a little, it's not so clear what's in the Torah. It just says that Yaakov seems to have taken advantage of the moment, of the opportunity in order to, in order That's to, yeah, Carol, go on. Yes. 
Yeah, because Yaakov is the younger. Again, we're set in the situation of the younger one. So it's really interesting. It's, you know, I actually feel like it's more of a spiritual birthright, actually, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the blessings that Yitzhak gives are not how much am I leaving to you? It's not that no. he says, Yaakov, you know, the whole thing about Bechora in Jewish, in Jewish law is that the elder, the firstborn, this is really odd to us living nowadays in modern day, that the Bechor, the Bechor not the woman, but if a, a boy is the oldest, that he gets double the portion. So if there's four children, you would divide into five and the eldest would get two and the others would get, you know, one, one portion divided into five. Mm -hmm. I would not say that that is what the story is of the Bechorah. It <laughs> seems to me much more of, thank you, Lance, much more of a spiritual inheritance. And that's also a question to me, because why do you need somebody to leave you a spiritual inheritance? Mm. Why wouldn't you just continue it on <laughs> your own? Just do it. So it's not 100% clear, but what is clear is this, and this is very important for me to share with you. It says that when a Sab agrees to sell his birthright, whatever that means, to Yaakov for a bowl of stew, it says, Vayivez et ha Now, who knows what that means? Yeah. yeah. Vayivez. What does it mean, Vivian? Well, he looked down upon it. He uh, thought it was horrible, it was disgusting. Right. He scorned it. Scorned it. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to think of yeah. 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 derision yeah. would be a word that could be used, right? Insulted it, all of those words, but he yeah. degraded, yeah. degraded. I, 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 I was thinking that the Bechora, uh, in this sense, also involved responsibility. Like the person who who has the Bechora is also responsible to take care of the family and make sure that there is a future and also observes all the necessary laws and everything that is required what by the family. What it's a wait, wait, Vivian, what necessary laws? What are you referring to? The laws, the laws of, that, that God has given them, what they need to do, uh, the, the laws of the Torah for that matter. Wait, well, are you saying that only one of ya of Yitzchak's children had to had to keep them? Well, apparently, uh, Asab didn't want to do that. He scorned that. He didn't. He didn't want no, to. No, but do what that. I yeah. don't. No, I hear you. I get that, and I agree with scorn. That's a good word. But I'm just not sure if that means that it was obvious to Yitzchak and Rivka that only one of their children would continue this line that's not so clear mm -hmm. to me i just i i that's what i'm saying i'm just saying it's a little murky that's yeah. all. and why yaakov needed it but i agree with you that clearly the bukhara comes along with something and the reason i'm spending so much time on it you may guess is because yeah. there is a pretty um direct connection between this and the haftara so that's the yeah. reason that i'm i'm spending time on by Yives, because it's all about attitude. And actually, when we get to the Haftarah, we will see that it's, all, I hope people are reading the chats because they're really sweet and very appropriate for Thanksgiving. <laughs> Appreciating them. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so he scorns the birthright. Again, not 100% sure, but I think all of us, it's interesting. I read a commentary that it seems like he sold it for the bowl of stew, but it's interesting when it says is it a recap of what happened or did he scorn it after he received the stew? Like even after he received it, he had, um, he scorned it. I still want to go back. I can't imagine that a sab, if it was a physical birthright that he would have scorned it. That doesn't make sense to me. Just doesn't make sense. Doesn't seem to fit with him. If it's about power and about, but th that's another reason why I think it's about a spiritual legacy that perhaps as Vivian is saying, was incumbent on the older one. It's not clear or expected from, but whatever it is, we have that by Yves. Okay, continuing on. Mm, um, uh, okay, there's a famine that actually isn't so connected. There's a famine, remember the same way as Abraham, but Yitzhak was not allowed to leave, was not allowed to leave Israel. 
and there was a repeat of the situation. I, it's this is not so related to the Haftarah, so but you know you're welcome to read about it if you want. In the third Aliyah, Isaac Yitzchak becomes very wealthy. Maybe he wasn't wealthy at the time. Who knows? But what happens afterwards is that. Uh, he be Isaac Yitzchak becomes wealthy, God appears to Isaac. But then what's so interesting is that Esav, this is continuing the motif of Esav, Esav married wives that made his parents very, very <laughs> unhappy because they had, I don't know how to pronounce this, I, idolatrous, is that the correct way to pronounce it? Mm -hmm. Idolatrous ways. They did not follow the ways of God, of our God, monotheism. They followed idolatry. And this made yeah. Yitzchak, and we've got very unhappy. Anybody can stop at any point if you want to ask me or make a comment. <clears throat> and now the next thing we know, Yitzhak is summoning Esav. It doesn't seem to be connected if he's unhappy with him, but he summons him to give him blessings. And Rivka is listening in the background. She's not happy, happy about this. And that's when the whole story of the duplicitousness, I don't know if that's the right to pronounce it, duplicitous, I don't know. Duplicity, somebody wants to tell me how to pronounce the word, that would be great, okay? And what happens? There's a trick. And the trick is that somehow Yaakov dresses up to be a sub and somehow manages to trick his father. Yeah. And then what happens is that um, Yitzhak does bless Yaakov with the dew of the heaven and the fat of the earth and mastery over his brother. <laughs> Which again, if this was the Bechorah, hard to imagine that Esav was wanted to give this up. And then we know that Esav comes and he comes to the field. He's really, really, really unhappy, obviously, because he was supposed to get the blessing. His brother mm -hmm. took it from him and he said he's going to kill him. And instead, Rivka says, you must run away. And that's, uh, and it's not, both Yitzhak and Rivka separately send Yaakov away to, to Rivka's family, actually. And to find a wife and also to get away from myself. Okay, are we clear about the parasha? Ted. Well, I just want to, <clears throat> yeah, I just want to add something. Last week I mentioned when we were talking about who was going to succeed David, and I said the first son is not necessarily the one you want. Correct. The motif that runs throughout Tanakh yeah. that you don't get to be, you don't get to inherit because you're the first. You get to inherit because you you should because you're the because you deserve it, and so you know we we see this here we see it uh, all over the place. Uh, the younger is going to the older is going to serve the younger, and the younger mm -hmm. is the one who deserves it. And it's so, not. It's so not how does that fit in with the? It seems like Yaakov had to buy the birthright. Well, I it's not. It's not an yeah. accident here that. The word bechora and the word bracha are the same letters, with yeah. just the two middle ones reversed. The Torah loves to play with words. Yeah. Um, Esau says, "Give me some of your stew. I'm dying of hunger." He's not really dying of hunger. Right. If the birthright meant anything to him, and the, mm. the birthright is associated with the bracha, the bechora with the bracha. If it meant anything to him, he'd say, "Okay, I'll wait a little bit. I'll go get. I'll go get a sandwich." If they had, we sandwich. still don't know what the bechorah is. Well, I think it's related. It, I think it's it's what you said the the spiritual inheritance, and it's related to the bracha. That ah, is the nice. bracha. So that when That's we nice. say that that Jacob, I, you know, I always object to this idea of Jacob as the trickster. Right. He's not tricking when he gets the bracha. He's bought it. It's his. But Yitzchak didn't know. Yitzchak about doesn't right? know. Rivka knows. But I could imagine doesn't... Esav wouldn't have wanted to admit to his father that Possibly. he's born the bechorah. <laughs> hey, Dad, and, guess what I just did? <laughs> right. And the, and the other thing is that, uh, you know, things are not as, as black and white as they're often painted. Esau is not a villain. I think you were tending in that direction. He does marry those two women, but, but when he, he sees that his parents are mm -hmm. unhappy, he marries two who are more suitable. That is correct. And he helps to bury Yitzchak. Right, and right. Later on, when, when Yaakov is so afraid of meeting him, he hugs him. 
And I know the rabbis say, you know, he was trying to yeah, bite yeah. his neck, but it doesn't say that in the Torah. Correct. I, I agree with you on that. I actually think it would be so cool to have a, a class on Asav and to redeem him a little and to stop a lot. We're all so used to, perhaps people at our age, at least, are used to the fact that the, the characters in the Torah are painted as black and white, and they're really not black and white. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Yes, that's very helpful here as well. Okay. Moving now to the Haftarah. So remember the whole subcommittee, I always like to call them that, who decided on which Haftarah, I'm just, for those who weren't here last week, it might be some people, this idea that there was a point in time where the authorities did not allow the Jews to read from the five books of Moses and therefore the, the Chachamim, the sages said, well, we can't just not read anything. So they always picked something that they felt had something to do either with the Torah portion or with the day, like if it was Rosh Chodesh or the next day, if it was Machar Chodesh, the, I just don't know where <laughs> feedback from. I'm just going to mute you for a minute, Vivian. It might be from you. And, or the time of year, like it could be a holiday or in the summertime, remember when it's the seven, the Shiva de Nechemta, the seven Parshiot of uh, the seven Haftarot of comfort, things like that, of consolation. But they still had to decide. So there's, they decided on this Haftarah from Malachi. So I learned a lot about Malachi yesterday when I was preparing. Malachi is the last of the 12 prophets. He's really the last prophet in the Bible or in the Tanakh. I don't know how to say Tanakh in the canon, maybe. Maybe that's the way to say it. There's no easy way to say Tanakh. Tanakh is Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim. So it's everything from the beginning of the world and Bereshit all the way to Chronicles, which is at the end, including uh, Tehillim and um, Mishle and the Megillot and all of the Navi'im, the prophets and the kings, et cetera. And well, most, and then many, 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 many prophets, the earlier prophets, later prophets. He is the last one. There are only three chapters in his name. We don't know very much about Malachi. Malachi actually means my angel or my messenger. And the rabbis had a bit of a debate about whether he could have actually been one of our other famous people like Ezra, the scribe, or Mordechai even, because Mordechai lived around the same time. Malachi lived at the beginning of the second temple period. So somebody here want to say, maybe you've learned in other classes, when our prophets yelled at us, what did they often yell at us about? Just sound bites about what? Not observing the rituals. Not observing the rituals. Uh, not believe, obeying God's Not obeying God's command. I, th I think, somebody else want to say something? Isaac? Yeah, I, yeah to do tshuva for a variety of things, you know. Whether right, but what kinds of things? Uh, it could be uh, worshiping idolatry. Right. It could be, uh, uh, what else? I, I just, I'm thinking. Of I think it's people. also very much about social norms or social interaction. I think the Nevi'im actually spent a lot of time yelling at us <laughs> or at the people of those times about the way they treated other people or did not treat them properly. Jeremiah is extremely famously known for that, where he told the Jews to finally let the Jewish slaves go because it was way, way, way after they were supposed to. And they did. And the very same day they took them back. So, right. so there's many, right, so, but Malachi goes more to what Carol said at the beginning. It's something about, it's something about, what did you say? Following God's laws? I can't remember what you said, Carol. Yeah, following God's laws, uh, you so know, the, yeah. the spiritual practices. The spiritual practice. So Malachi, you're going to see, is very, very specific about what, about what he's yelling at us about. And he's not only that. He doesn't really direct it to everybody, at least in this part. I didn't read all the other chapters. There aren't so many of them, but it's about one and a half chapters, something like that. But he directs it in a very small group, which I found really fascinating. So I'm going to share the screen to so that we can look together. I mean, everybody's welcome to look at their own. Just a moment, let me find it. Ah, that's my computer. Here we go. Starts at the beginning, and here is how it starts. Masa, which is so interesting. Masa means a burden. In this case, it's called an announcement. 
Nasi is a prince, but it also means to lift up. So this is God's word in the hands or through Malachi. And I think we can see very, very quickly that there's a connection here. I'm sure this is what alerted the rabbis who set it up to use this. I have shown you love, said God. I love this question, by the way. Why, why do you love us? What, what, well, in what way have you shown us? I think it could be translated a few ways. And one of the commentaries that I read said that, do you love us because of our zechut avot, because in the merit of our forefathers, or do you love us for ourselves? And it continues, this is a back and forth conversation, as you can see from the English. Hello, ach, esav liyakov neum Hashem ve'ohav et Yaakov. But remember, esav and Yaakov are brothers, as God said, ve'ohav, and I love Yaakov. So reminding us, going all the way back to this parasha. So this, this feels connected. It's interesting because if you look at this, it seems like God is saying, it was right that Rivka loved Yaakov. I mean, I didn't see this written anywhere in any of the commentaries, but I thought this was such a support that Rivka made the right decision and that she loved Yaakov, given even, just stopping sharing for one moment, even given the thought that I believe that the more love we show our children, the better off they are. And we really can't make that decision about who we love and who we don't with our children. But in this case, it feels like there was a covenantal life going and promise and uh, uh, not lineage, I guess lineage and passing on of the covenantal connection, the covenantal vow from God and blessing. So that seems to supersede perhaps Rifka's maternal instincts. <clears throat> okay. And I hated Esav or rejected. So this seems, if you can read the English, I hope everybody can read it. Is it large enough to read? I have made his hills a desolation, his territory home for beasts of the desert. So this seems to start really nicely because this also flows very, very nicely with the blessing that Yaakov gave. I didn't pull up the blessing here. We could look at that a little bit later. And continuing on, let's read the English, though crushed, we can build the ruins again. Thus said the Lord of hosts, you can try to build Edom. Edom here is representative of Goyim, of Rome, actually. They may build, but I will tear it down. And they shall be known as the region of wickedness, the people damned forever of the Lord. So this, I mean, this still is pitting Yaakov and Esav against each other. And your eyes shall behold it, and you shall declare, great is the Lord beyond the borders of Israel. So this seems to be a somewhat introduction. Now there's a flip. There's a switch. And this is what I'd like to spend a little bit of time on with you. Ben yichabed av ve'eved Adonav. A son should honor his father and a slave his master, obviously son or son and daughter. Ve'im avani, and if I'm the father, aye kvodi, where is my honor? Ve'im adonim ani, aye morai. And if I am your master, where is the, the morai, like the awe or reverence due to me? God says this. Lachem hakohanim. Malachi is specifically speaking to the priests who did not treat their service properly and God properly. Bozei shemi. So remember, we said vayivez et habechora, vayivez et habechora, that Esav scorned the bechora or the bracha, as Ted suggested. So God is saying, you know what? I love you. I promised you that. But there's a problem here. You're not upholding your end of the bargain. Meaning, well, I want to talk about what you think it means and I could bring my own thought. So the Kohanim, here's, this is what, again, Ted was saying that the Torah likes to play with words. So sometimes the Torah likes to repeat it, the Tanakh. And I think that the sages picked up on both the Esav Yaakov at the beginning of this chapter as well as this idea of scorning, because we may be entitled to God's love, but what God is saying here, you're not going to keep it if you don't uphold, if you, if you treat me poorly. So then you said, how have we scorned your name? By the way, before, before we continue to the next passage, 
Just any thoughts about that? Any ideas, any thoughts, any reactions? No, okay. Feel free please to, if I don't see you to unmute and interrupt. <clears throat> okay, continuing on. What did you do? You offered magishima mizbechi lechem megoal, defiled food, v'amartem. So this is so interesting that it's like Malachi is anticipating what Bnei Israel would say, and he said, it's because you said, look at how many times this chapter is repeating this word of scorning. Because remember that korbanot offerings have to be perfect or perfect to a certain extent. For example, you present a blind animal for sacrifice, it doesn't matter. A lame or sick one, it doesn't matter. And then you ask, will God accept it? So I would really like to unpack with you a little more what the scorning was, because I feel like this, this to me feels like the key. At the beginning, there's a beautiful intro that says, I love you, just like Rivka loved Yaakov. You're the chosen one. I prefer you over Esav, and Esav is representative at that time, the second temple. Esav, I guess, was representative of the, um, of the, the Goyim who were the goyim, the, the non-Jews who were oppressing the Jews at the time. We can take this as general. But I would really like to tap into with you, what is the scorning? What does that mean? How do we do that? What, what, you know, what is God trying to say? Because this does not feel like the usual uh, yelling that the prophet gives. This is but unusual. It, First of all, he's saying it about the Kohanim specifically. Yes, Ted. But it, it is related because no what more. the prophets are almost always so upset about is um, not fulfilling what God wants, which in many cases, as you said before, involves the ethical and moral social behavior. Right. But, but I'm more you, familiar with that. If you look at the first chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah says, what do I want with your sacrifices? I don't need your sacrifices. And right. you think about it, God doesn't need our sacrifices, right? I mean, so- Well, he, I think, one second, I think maybe God doesn't want them unless there is caring and thoughtfulness behind it. Is that well, what you're Caring saying? and thoughtfulness. And if you're just doing the ritual and leaving out the moral and the social, then you're not really doing the ritual. Uh, right, because the you, you can't honor God if you treat people badly. If everybody has the tzelam elokim, you can't mistreat people and then go to shul and say, "Look at my fine sacrifices." I and, agree, but is that what it says here? And here, what he's saying is, you can't bring sacrifices that aren't perfect. I mean, if they're not bringing the best stuff for Hashem, then what are they doing with it? They're keeping it for themselves. And that's uh, you know, going through the motions of the sacrifice. Ah, uh, that's, I didn't think of that. But I'm not really doing them. Beautiful. Thank you, Ted. That's very helpful. So you're making, I think what you're doing, one second, Vivian, is you're taking a step back and looking at it as a complete, you know, as yeah. more of the prophets together with others. Very nice. Beautiful. Vivian, unmute, unmute, unmute. Unmute. Vivian. Vivian. Woo. Unmute. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now I'm, <laughs> I have to worry about all this stuff too. Anyhow. Yes, so the, the, the Torah gives instruction that when you bring a sacrifice, you have to bring the best of your sacrifice uh, right. in order to sacrifice to God. And here they're taking the worst of it and all the junk and whatever and bringing it and just uh, without the spirit and without really following what, what's supposed to be. Right. They, 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 they're just looking down on it. Like like they're something scorning, they're yeah. scorning God's it's instructions. Scary. They're scorning yeah. God's instructions. And I, I mean, this thought that they're keeping the better animals for themselves yeah. to eat. Themselves. Also, the, there's no spirit in it. The, the, the spiritual part is gone. It's like, the, it's totally scorned. It's worse than not bringing anything. Right, which goes along with your shayao. Thank you, I see the nodding. Yeah. I mean, not everybody has to agree. Anybody who wants to push yeah. back, that's fine. I'm only in the robes of Chechem. What, what do I need all your, all your sacrifices? It's just junk, it means nothing. 
It's Beautiful. The, the spirituality behind it. Yeah. Robert, did you want to speak? Because I think, Robert, you're unmuted. No, okay, so let me mute you because we can yeah. hear that, if you don't mind. Yeah, I, I, great. Judith, the Vakasha. I'm not disagreeing, but I'm bringing up something else and I don't know if it has meaning or not. It doesn't use the word sacrifice. It uses the word lechem. It's talking about bringing food that isn't good. And what Esau sold his birthright for was food. Wait, 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 one second. Are you talking about in the Haftarah? Haftarah. Like oh, that's in seven. Lechem. That's in Zion. But look in Chet now for a minute, Judith. And I am not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying. In the fact, it does say that. that's true. Right, so it's both, but you're right, Lechem, that's so interesting because that is interesting. Usually when we talk about sacrifice or offerings, I like to use the word offering, it's usually about the animal or the meal offering. And this is specifically Lechem, which is a general, well, the, the way I've seen it translated is that it's food. Lechem is like a staple, so it's general. There is actually the Shtei HaLechem, there's the 12 loaves, there's the two loaves, there's the loaves on Shavuot, so that's very interesting. And you're saying that connects to you also to food because of the Bechorah. Yeah. Ayib is a double, very nice. Because that wasn't me. Right? The, mm -hmm. I'm saying the, the stew, right. as far as we know, was lentils. Right. Mm. By the way, well, yeah, I don't quite know what it means, but it means something. It's another link. Right. To, right. By the way, does anybody know the Medrash, the Midrash of why they were having lentil stew? Mm. Somebody reminded me of it yesterday. Avelut. Why, Moshe? With yeah. the death of um, Avelut. Yitzchak. The death oh, of Abraham. Abraham, right. Of Abraham. That Yitzchak was sitting Shiva, and they were coming back. Remember, there's a special Su'udat Havra'a that we offer the mourners when they come back from the when they come back from the funeral. And we offer um, a hard-boiled egg because it's round, but Lentils are similar. Remember, we say we use an egg or lentils. No Our mouth. The world goes, no mouth. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Doesn't have a mouth as if the mourner doesn't have what to say because it's so struck by shock or doesn't know what to say. So it's a medrash. It's a midrash. And you know, I love shot, but I also love medrash. Like I like them both. So it's kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a thought. By the way, the reason that that's an interesting midrash, I just want to point this out, something to take with you. Is because even though it says that Abraham died in the previous parsha, remember Yishmael and Yitzchak buried him. Even mm -hmm. though it says that, according to this midrash, Abraham was still alive, and that and that was happening before Yitzchak had children, as far as we know, in the last parsha. But according to this midrash, Abraham was alive when the children were grown up, because Yaakov and Esav, if Esav is hunting in the field and Yaakov is making food. Then. So just keeping that in mind that there are different ways to look at this. So I like that. That's another connection that I had not thought of, Judith, that that was the connection about um, food and not necessarily meat. But then the next, and that connects to the scene about the Bechorah with the stew. There's another connection with meat, which is in the next Pasuk, because remember, Esav went to hunt. That's exactly what Yaakov, sorry. Yitzchak asked his son to go hunt Sayyid Bafid, that he wanted to have delicious delicacies. I'm sorry if I offend people who are vegetarian or vegan or vegetarian. <laughs> Apologies. Um, but that is what it says in the... By the way, I want to teach you a new word. This is completely in parentheses. It's a word that I learned. The word is tzimcholi. Tzimcholi or tzimcholi. Tzimcholi, vegetarian. I didn't say tzimcholi. Tzimcholi oh. means vegetarian. Not pescatarian. Oh, simcholi. simcholi means vegetarian on chol, meaning during the week. It's somebody who only know. eats, <laughs> I like seeing those smiles, oh, who only okay. eats meat or chicken on Shabbat. Oh. It's cool, okay. right? It's simchoni bechol. Simchoni mm -hmm. on yemot chol. So for those who know a little bit of people, it's I a very. Rav Cook, I think Rav Cook did that. Oh, he, yeah. yeah, but I don't know if he invented that word, Moshe. Not the word, but he did. Exactly. So yeah, no, I agree. It's not a new idea, but what's sweet about it is that it has a name that's a very clever name. It's a play on words in Hebrew. Simcholi mm -hmm. instead of simchoni. Okay. Going back. Yes. Uh, oh, you're just giving a thumbs up. Anybody else have something to say or should we go back? Isaac, did you want to say something? No. Okay. Going, going back to our Torah. Good. Thank you. This is beautiful. What's so nice about this, because we do it before Shabbat, is for those of us who come to show or read the Haftarah at home, I think it'll be just so much more meaningful 
Usually when they read mm -hmm. the Haftarah, you're meeting it for the first time. You don't usually prepare. But that's one of the reasons that I love this class, that we mm -hmm. have an opportunity to really prepare for the, for the Haftarah portion, Haftarah. Okay, continuing. Oh, so wait, there's another thing that I read. One second, the Chet Lamed, where else is it? So um, using those words, this lechem, remember we said Judith pointed out that the word lechem is used, which is an unusual, like why use lechem? How often do we bring bread? But the lamed chet is here. Look, it's also in piseach v'chole, that the animal is lame or ill. And it continues, v'ata chaluna, implore, so Hanenu is from a different source, but here the Chet and the Lamed is repeated. And the other thing I want to show to you, right? Because, because Malachi, when Malachi chooses his words, assuming he chose them himself, I don't know if God actually literally put the words in his mouth, that I don't know. But the Torah, the Tanakh loves to do alliteration. Is that the right way to say it? When you use the same letters so that it resonates nicely in your ears. So one of the verbs and source uh, roots that's used over and over is this chet lamed in different ways. There's the lechem, there's lechem egoal, then there's piseach uh, vechole, and then there's chaluna, and there's more as we'll go along. And here's another one. Remember we started out by saying the first pasuk, masa devar Hashem, lift up. So that also is in here which is interesting because nisiyut kapayim or nasi kapayim means to bless. Like that's what the Kohanim do. It's, that's what the mm. blessing Birkat Kohanim is nisiyat kapayim. That's what they remember. They raise their hands, they separate their fingers and they bless us by raising their hands literally over us under their talit. So that is also repeated in here. So it's something to notice for those who are looking at the Hebrew. There's something to notice. I'm going to point out to you. No, not yet. Ben Yechabed, it's in here. Nope, next one. Oh, Hayisa Panecha. So Yisa Panecha is, will he lift your face? Meaning, will God accept what you bring when it is tainted as it is? So implore the favor of God. Same thing. Will yeah. God lift face towards you? Okay. If only you would lock my doors and not kindle fire on my altar to no purpose. This is exactly the repeat of what a number of people here brought up in Yeshayahu. I take no pleasure in you and I will accept no offering from you. So mm. you know, this reminds me, just saying, um, oh, by the way, here is Chinam Chet Nun comes up a few times, Mincha. So these are repeating themselves and, and the Hanenu, look, and just two psukim, it comes up three different times. So remember what happened when Cain and Hevel brought their offering? Mm -hmm. So remember that God did not accept Cain's offering and it wasn't 100% yeah, right. clear from the text. Why didn't God accept? So I just love when the same motifs come up and kind of thread their way through. And because we're slowing down the Haftarah and really looking at the psukim, we have an opportunity to see these motifs. Mm -hmm. So so remember, if you remember the commentaries, I don't know if it was Rashi, I don't have it in front of me, say, why didn't God accept Kain's offering? It wasn't clear why, because according to that interpretation, because God didn't accept it. So if God didn't accept it, then you have to come up with the, you don't have to come up with the reason, but it kind of begs a reason. And one of the reasons <laughs> given is that Kain did not pick the choicest. Maybe Kain also picked, um, Wait, what did he pick? He picked the fruits of the ground, right? And Hevel brought meat. I think it was the opposite. But mate, but Cain, according to this interpretation, did not bring, did not bring with a whole heart, saved the best for himself and didn't bring the best for God. And you can mm -hmm. see through the, the prophecies of the Nevi'im, why the commentaries backed by Cain and Hevel would have even said that. Because we mm -hmm. know God says, if you don't either bring it with a whole heart, or if you, well, Cain didn't have many people to treat poorly, honestly, there weren't many people in the world at that point. But if Cain wasn't bringing it with a whole heart, it wasn't, you know, was kind of lip saying it, you know, doing it just in order to kind of check that box to bring it to God, then God knew what was in Cain's heart. 
Mm. Does this resonate for people that the same motif comes up in different places? Yeah, and people, yeah you're saying that. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, I love when you agree, and I also love when you push back. They both work. Yes, Arnie. So I think um, for me, I have to try to hold two opposite thoughts in my mind when I read this, because I can understand in Esau's case why he's viewed as the lesser of the two. Why? Because of all the things we're saying, because he dismissed, he dismissed birthright. Right. He disobeyed his parents when he um, chose a woman to get married. Right. Go. But at the same time, yep. it seems like before Esau was born, God had it in for him. <laughs> so it seems like God set this whole thing up this way. Wow. Because and, of what God said to Rifka that, when she was yeah. pregnant. Yeah. And even So you're way, saying Asab might have not ever had a chance? Exactly. Look at the beginning of the Haftarah, the very second line. God says, I reject Esau. He doesn't give a reason. Um Yep, but they subsaneti. I have rejected or hated Asab. Yep. He says, right, he loves Jacob. He doesn't have to reject Esau to love Jacob. That's true. Um, so I think, I think you know, right. the Bible used to do these wonderful trials from <gasps> I heard Jewish about family. them. I would I would love it if they brought God in for a trial. <laughs> So mm -hmm. um, I might be busy that night. I'm not sure I could do it. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to put God on trial. We'll have to figure out a way to put people on trial for that. Maybe we've kind of talk or something like that. Um, thank you, Arnie. I I think that's. I see you, Judith, and I'm, just one second. And Isaac, I love that. First of all, thank you for bringing in. You know, it's a richer conversation when we bring in a little more uh, spicy uh, thoughts. So I, I hear that, actually. I did actually speak this week in Azvar Torah of Zim and Hamarev, and I said, even though, <laughs> even <laughs> though, I'm just as reading the chat, even yeah. though Asub seems to have been in his DNA, I believe people always have choice. I believe people always, always, always have choice, can always choose to take a different path. That is my personal belief as a woman, as a rabbi, as a grandmother, as a coach. I believe that people have choice. So yes, and also a little bit no. Judith, what did you want to say? Um, it's sort of an, another thing in defense of Esau. This is the child who knew his mother didn't love him from the get-go. Yeah. So whatever badness he has, it, it's just kind of chicken-egg thing. Yeah, 100%. So hearing you on that one, thank you. I, I mean, I didn't expect this to be about Esau. That's what makes it so beautiful. Thank you. I'm so appreciative. You guys are totally pushing me to do a year when I talk about like um, when our class would be about problematic personalities, you know, and then mm. really digging into them. I think that would be an amazing year, but not this year. But thank you for planting that seed. Isaac. Oh, uh, I wasn't able to say anything about ASO, but since it was brought okay. up, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the Midrash is that uh, because of ASO saying father, you know, Abba, isn't there isn't there a blessing for me that's really so painful and heartfelt? Yes. yes. You know, Beth says that uh, the uh, the Jews paid for it later, and got, you know, something, uh, whatever, whether it's in Galut or whatever, the uh, that there was some payback for that. So I agree. Uh, yes. Yeah. So that actually allows a little more gray area. It's not all black and white, right? Yeah. Is that but, what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Hello? I mean, it, it humanizes him. You know, it, it uh, takes him out of uh, yes. uh, being an yes. arbitrary. And, um, mm. you know, I always felt for that, even when I was a kid in yeshiva, it was, uh, you know, there was always that uh, ace of the art, the arch villain. Yeah. Uh, and then there was ace of that was, uh, seemed to be human. And we know that he was very, very. Yeah, uh, I, uh, I once saw. Kibodave aim, so. 
I saw a bibliodrama on that, which was fascinating, where he acted as a sub. It was, it was amazing. Jessica, just one second, Vivian. Jessica, did you want to say something? Yes, I did. Um, Please. The characters of Yaakov and Asaf performed in the womb. Shnego Yim from Ayayach. Yep. Yiparedu. And they, um, one will be good and one will be bad. And that was it. But it doesn't say one will be good and one will I be bad. I don't think, right. I'm looking at the, I need to look mm. at the text. That would be helpful. I should always have the, 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 the reason. What does it say, Ted? Mm. One second, Vivian. Yeah. It, says, it, it just says that they're, they're going to be, uh, they're going to be at odds and the older will serve the younger. One right. of the reasons we think of Asav as being bad is because based on partly on this uh, passage from Malachi, uh, when the Romans came along, and the Jews had to be very careful about what they said about the Romans. They referred to the Romans as Edom, as Asaph. Asaph. And so the, the Romans, they were the bad guys. And so we tend to think of Asaph as a bad guy. But, uh, you know, that's, that's an unfortunate association, I think. Okay. Interesting and everything. And an everything. interesting thing, yeah. another interesting thing, just very quickly, is that when Christianity mm -hmm. came along and they said there was the older and the younger and the older is going to serve the younger, it was the Jews who were Asav and the Christians who were Yaakov. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That's interesting. Go figure that I, one I out. Remember, I remember my father would use the, the expression Asav, and that said it all. <laughs> That's right. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Vivian. Something short, because I want to do a little bit of uh, further. What? Yeah, I was thinking of why Asa was the bad guy and Yaakov was the good guy. That uh, in the Torah, it says uh, uh, that children have to listen to their parents. It's a Ben Sorer More who doesn't listen to the parents. And uh, the parents told the children that they need to marry someone of their own. And Rivka said, sent Yaakov back to find Rivka and to, to find a, a wife, uh, Rachel and Leah and so on. And uh, uh, Asab did not listen to the parents and he went he married, he married all these women whom the parents rejected. And he violated that very important rule of listening to the parents. So that's okay. Interesting. He was a Ben Sorer Moret. Right. I, so just so you know that I, I hear that the rabbis interpreted Ben Sorer Moret can only be from age 12 and a half to 13. That's when they put work clothes on that, but I, I on that halacha and they say it never happened. But I think you're using it as a ge generic term that he didn't. <laughs> I think we know a lot of people who, um, in that sense, don't listen to their parents. I don't know that they have to be rejected. I don't believe that. Just saying, mm -hmm. you know, um, I mean, one of my four children does not believe in God and does not observe the laws of Judaism. It's totally not rejected by me. And, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm just giving this as an example that as some, somebody said this here also, like it, God didn't have, who said that? God didn't have to reject Esav in order to love Yaakov. The setting, mm -hmm. like what I'm hearing in this group, and without you said it, Isaac. What I'm yeah. hearing, yeah. What? I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I mean, there's also a midrash that uh, says that Yaakov, uh, by not allowing, you know, that Dina would have been an appropriate match for Asaf, and Yaakov didn't allow it, and he's helped to account on that. So. So this is this is great and amazing food for another food for another yes. shiur. Um, but what I am hearing here, which I love, is that it seems like the Torah is trying to set things up as black and white mostly. Not the midrashim. The midrashim allow gray area in places, like you said, you know, that we were held accountable mm -hmm. or Yaakov was. But I'm hearing so many reasons why he was almost like that he was fingered or, you know, uh, what's the word for it? Like the finger was pointed to him and he wasn't, and everything he did perhaps was misinterpreted, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And that there were many reasons why he might have chosen the path that he chose. I, I think this is, this is terrific. This is just 
terrific ideas that um, I would totally use in a class on ASAP, which I am yearning to do now. What I would like to do in the few minutes that we have left is to just share a few thoughts to go through a little bit towards the end of the Haftarah. I think this totally not just helps us understand the connection of the Haftarah to the Torah portion, but I think when we read the Torah portion of the Shabbat, it'll be much more meaningful to me. I think I'll read it with new eyes, given what everybody has, has offered here. Wanted to go down a little bit. Uh, I'll just try to skim through this. If the dome thinks so crushed, we can build the ruins again. And this is, yes, is it, it's Rome. A, a dome is associated with Rome and God is actually reassuring the Jews. If you look on the other side, it's not against, it's not about telling Esav you'll be crushed, but telling the Jews, don't worry, you will make it through. But only if you do what you should do. If you profane it, and if the table of the Lord is defiled and the meat, the food, shulchan, okay, can be treated with scorn. Again, the word scorn. And if you degrade it and continuing on with the same words that was used before, will I accept it from you? No. And here's the thing, a nochel is a trickster or a cheat. And it's interesting to me because Yaakov is the one actually who tricked or at least acted on what seems like trickery. If anybody in our Parsha seems to be devious, it seems to be Yaakov. So is this also giving Yaakov a little, is this throwing us back to the parasha and giving just a little bit of Musar back to Yaakov that there was something not quite right about the way he did that. But what I want to finish with is that Shevet Levi, the tribe of Levi, which has the Kohanim and the Levim, remember they don't have a Nachala in Israel, that well, the Levim actually had some cities that were, that were theirs, but they weren't given fields in Israel, which means that they were dependent on the rest of the tribes for food and for money, but they were teachers and they were supposed to be a, an example for the rest of Israel. So when the priests, when the Kohanim are not respecting that and they're showing uh, the rest of B'nai Israel that they don't respect God, what's going to happen? Like this is going to permeate out, which is feels like the reason why Malachi is targeting the priests and saying, I have to hold you accountable first. It's like when you have government or you have uh, people who you know you look up to, if the gabaim of the shul or if the uh, teachers or principal in the school, I mean, I, I'm not pointing a finger at anybody specifically, but if the leadership and the ones that are the role models, if they're not doing things, if they're not showing how you, how you should honor God, how will the people of Israel know how to do that? So unless mm -hmm. you obey and lay it to your heart, do honor to my name, I will send a curse and turn your blessings into curses and more. Um, know then that I've sent this charge to you that my covenant. Now, I just want to talk about Levi. Remember at the beginning, here's another connection. <laughs> Take a few more mm. minutes. I have something at, at sharp at 11.15. That's uh, at 12.15. Sorry, that's why I had to stop. The, remember who first were the ones who worked in the Beit HaMikdash? Who were they? Levi'im. Before the Levi'im, Jessica. Before yeah. that. Hmm. It was the firstborn. It was yeah. the firstborn. Now, those were the actual firstborns. I don't think at the time, if you sold your birthright to your younger brother, you could work in the Beit HaMikdash. I don't know exactly when it switched. And it has something to do with being spared the firstborn is some connection there. But that's another connection that the Kohanim were actually chosen to work instead of the Bechorot, instead of the firstborn. And that's another kind of background connection that's floating through here. But God chose she Shevet Levi to work in the temple, to be the teachers and the leaders and to have a special place. That's hmm. the spiritual birthright. That yeah. must be the spiritual birthright. Thank you, Carol. So glad you joined in today. <laughs> well, it came, it came after, the, after the golden calf. I so, think it did, but then I read in a history thing, so I'm not, I, that is when it came, but I feel like they did some work. I think it was, oh, I think it was with the Mishkan. That's when it was. It was when the Mishkan was set. Before that, the, the firstborn did. Thank you for reminding me. I knew there was a certain turning point. When the tabernacle was built, the Kohanim and Levian were the ones who were assigned, and at that point, it switched. Correct. And that's and you, why we have a pigeon, a Ben. 
right? That's why, right. We have to sort of buy back the Bechreden. Yeah. It's a little more complicated, Wait. but yes. I have a firstborn. My son is firstborn, so we did that actually. We did yeah, that. Yeah, I had a life. firstborn too, but at the time we weren't religious. But just before he got married, we, <laughs> our friend who was a Kohan, well, we did the whole that. ceremony like but just a week a, before he got married. I had well, a, probably I had a before that. So they said because I had a miscarriage, it was no longer Peter Rechem, so you can't have a Peter event, which Correct. was fine. <laughs> There are a few reasons. Petar Recha means the first of the womb. What's so interesting is that if a man is married to more than one, a Kohen, or um, oh. no, not a Kohen, if a person, if a man is married to more than one wife and it is the first of the woman's womb, how often do you ever count the woman, yeah. right? That's right, so unusual. Right. But if a man married and then married again, and the, the and again had a firstborn son from the womb, he would, uh, he would have a second before. It's just fascinating that whole thing mm. again something for another time i'd love that idea as well talk about it but anyway so i just wanted to finish with this idea that the that when somebody is designated and has a, a, a calling or has a role i take this very seriously as somebody who as a rabbi who you know people often just look at at what the leaders do not that anybody should behave inappropriately but um there's there's a lot of weight to yeah. that, and and the Levim and the Kohanim were not, or the Kohanim in this case perhaps, were not taking it seriously. So I think that this group found amazing number of connections. I'm very grateful. I loved this conversation. Um, doesn't matter how much I prepare ahead of time, the conversation is always richer when people bring in their thoughts, and it makes it so much more. We can all read books about it. I, I you should just know I have. Four books open in front of me. <laughs> They're all about the Haftarah. And somebody keeps sending me more. Oh, you could listen to this one, read this one. But it's more yeah. interesting when people participate. So I want to thank people for your thoughtfulness. Um, I found, um, I just, I feel like I go into Shabbat so much better prepared after we have this class. So thank you, Phyllis, for your suggestion. And thank you, everybody, for attending and for participating. And always happy to see you. Whenever you can make it, Judith, if it ever gets canceled again, come back. Come back. I'd love to. It's a great class. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I really Thank, Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you, everybody. Let me say goodbye. Cameron. Thank Happy Thank Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Isaac, Arnie, Stephen, Ted and Phyllis, Robert, Moshe. Mm -hmm. What's people pop off Moshe? Uh, Milton, Judith, Lance, yeah. Vivian. I hope I got everybody. Yeah. I mean, Isaac, Felicia. Good. Sending love to all. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. Well yeah, done. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. And Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom Chodesh Tov.